Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. All right, hey everybody, welcome to episode 281 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation. I'm your host, Anthony Renna, and the show notes are located on my site at continuefit.com. It's also where you can find out more about my book, Be Like the Best, which is 50 interviews with top fitness professionals. And after each interview is a Be Like, which is just an action step or a challenge that'll help you be like the best. Check it out at continuefit.com. All right, today on the shrinkcoach.com, Coach's Corner. I spoke to Coach Boyle about civil disobedience, which we've been seeing a lot of throughout the country right now. People protesting. Talked about what's happening in regards to opening up in Massachusetts, as, as well as a possible class action lawsuit they might be organizing. So stay tuned for that. For the results, Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. Alan Cosgrove is on to talk about a survey that they did at Results Fitness with their members and why it's important for you to do the same. So if you also want to lead your fitness business through the here and now, they're doing a, they just done a great webinar. It's free and it's all about the pivots that they've made at Results Fitness to continue to show up for their clients through the pandemic and the exact steps that you need to take to do the same. Go to resultfitnessuniversity.com to check that out. All right, today for the Train Heroic Data-Driven Coaching segment, Adam Doughty talks to Tim Robinson about remote coaching strategies when you don't have a lot to work with. Tim is doing that and he doesn't have a lot to work with, so they talk about that. Remember, Train Heroic is a human performance company that both Coach Boyle and I used to deliver all of our online training. We've both been blown away by how Train Heroic allows us to connect with our athletes. It's pretty cool. You can go in and just like use that as a platform to text them and to message them. So if you're a coach and you're not coaching on Train Heroic, I don't know what you're waiting for. You know, I've been talking about this for a while. So they just launched plans that will start as low as $10 a month. And they also have a free 14-day trial. And if you mention that I sent you, they're going to put a four-week athlete development program from Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning into your account absolutely free. So if your coach looking for the best online training solution in the game, go to trainheroic.com. Take the 14-day free trial. All right, for the functional movement system segment, Gray Cook is on to talk or continue his six-part series. Today it's part four. He'll discuss control when or this part five. So and then part six, after he does part six, we're gonna put it on the next episode. Then we're gonna have a special episode where we put them all together because this is a series. For the Body by Boyle online.com, hit the gym with the strength coach segment. I have on Nick Winkleman, been waiting for this for a while. He is the author of the bestseller, The Language of Coaching. If you're a longtime listener, you know we did the art of coaching originally with Nick uh, in two th- starting in 2011. We talked about the book, Language of Coaching. It just came out, it's a bestseller. Uh, his epiphany at the combine and how it led him on this journey for the language of coaching. 3P performance model and figuring out what is coachable and what is trainable. Motor performance versus motor learning. Why we need to use silent sets to understand if what we're doing is even working. Talks about the Goldilocks principle. Also the importance of attention and how we can get our athletes and clients to pay more attention to what we're doing. Teaching athletes to focus. He has a great little exercise you can do with your with your teams. This is a really long interview and uh, it could have been much longer. There's so many nuggets, so I know you're gonna enjoy this one. Lots of things to get to, so let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the strengthcoach.com Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle. Strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. You can try it out. We extended the trial. We're still going. Uh, Coach Boyle lives in Massachusetts. I live in New York. We're both still under 
the quarantine, the shutdown, the lockdown, whatever you want to call it. So we extended the trial. We pretty much said we we're going to do this till we're open. So it's 30 days for a dollar. You have access to all the articles, videos, and programs, as well as the best forum on the net. It's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every day answering questions. We're trying to keep uh, up to date with whatever's going on with different COVID-19 resources. So check it out at strengthcoach.com. Coach, how you doing? I'm doing good, Ann. How are you? Doing okay. Hanging in there. Trying to, uh, you know, trying to stay, keep it simple. Uh, you know, with a lot of stuff, even, even my clothes, I went to Costco and got just these black shirts and I'm like, I'm just going to go, I'm going to limit my decisions. And my workouts have been really simple and trying to keep everything (laughs) really simple. So, uh, that was my, Michaela always makes fun of me. She's like, which black shirt are you going to wear today? Yeah. (laughs) Trying to limit decision fatigue and and limit that stress. So, um, Cindy, we've been wearing the same clothes every week because we wear them and then we wash them and they end up back on top of the pile. And yeah. you know, this sometimes three or four days don't go by where we don't do laundry. So I just I'm like, no one sees me. No one's gonna say, Oh, you always have the same you always have the same clothes on because I always see the same people too. And kind of look at the kids and say, Yeah, you're always here. Every time I turn around, you're still here. But. <laughs> well, you know what's interesting is I actually have I have this may be a little too much information, but uh Costco has these like 360 degree whatever and they're they're really kind of like the dry fit like shirts and underwear right so I have those and I have these pants from Go Ruck called the simple pants that you could basically work out in no problem and so I have the shirt so I also work out in these clothes obviously I you know the pants I don't have to wash every day, but the and they're really easy. These simple pants they dry. You can put them in the washer and then they dry in literally like two hours. Um, and you don't put them in a, a dryer. And so I've been I'll like come to work and I'll work out at the end of the day, go home and change my shirt, take a shower usually at the end of the day. And uh, so yeah, I'm even trying to simplify that. So yeah, no, I've been I'm like you. I get up every day. Usually I've been getting up every day between five and five thirty, and working lately. I've been sitting in the hot tub. I've been reading Nick Winkleman's book a little bit in the hot tub, which is pretty interesting. It's one of those. It's definitely not a cover to cover job for me, but it's more of like a pick my way through kind of book. But I've been sitting, sitting in the hot tub for 15, 20 minutes in the morning, take a shower, do some more work on the computer. It's uh, it's been an interesting life. Yeah, I agree. I Nick about Nick's book, by the way. He's on today's show. How about me to come throwing the plug right in there? I know. <laughs> um, I'm loving it so far. Uh, and I'm the same way. I told Nick that even on the, on the in the interview. It's uh, I haven't finished it yet. But um, it's I, I'm dying to go to page 200 and just start from there, right? Because you get all the beautiful graphics and the cues. And, and he does a great yeah, job with yeah. it. So. And I might be doing that next. <laughs> yeah. Um, but... Coach, let's go to what's happening in the gym world right now. You're closed, and you guys, I, I got to say, Massachusetts the, has been ridiculous with talk about confusing uh, what, never mind what phase you're in or what's going to happen. I mean, it, it was ridiculous. And so in the beginning, you were, a little, you're, you were kind of voicing that. You even posted on traincoach.com. Thoughts on civil disobedience. We started a forum thread, some people that were uh, protesting outside the courthouse. And then you read something by Thomas Plummer and you felt like he I think he was saying basically, look, don't bitch and moan publicly. You're only going to piss some people off. So just keep it quiet for now. Do your thing. Clean your gym. Get ready to open. But uh, now you guys, I guess have been told you're going to not going to be opening for a while and now you're pissed. So just give us an overview of, of kind of this roller coaster ride you've been on. Yeah, we're in, it's, it's very interesting. I do believe that it's becoming political. Um, and I do believe it's become pretty random in terms of next week on the 25th, you'll be able to get a haircut in a 500 square foot barbershop from someone one foot away from you but we're not going to be able to have 30 people in a 20,000 square foot facility where we can easily social distance the instructors from them and them from each other. So to me, it doesn't make any sense what they're doing. And it just shows that they don't even really understand 
sort of what I would call emerging industries like ours, we're going to get lumped in with Gold's Gym, you know, in places that have sort of these herds of equipment and treadmills all next to each other. I, someone today sent me a study saying, well, this is why they're not going to let gyms open. And it was a study on South Korean aerobics classes. Yeah. Saying that they're that. big transition. So, but then I, of course, I do what I always do. I read the study. And I said, okay, did you read the study? I said, because the study says that there were between five and 22 people in 60 square meters, which is 700 square feet. So I said, even at five people per 700 square feet, that's about 120 people or 120 square foot per person on the lowest end that they had. We're thinking between three and 400 square feet per person if we want to apportion it out that way. And uh, so, I mean, it's not an apples to apples comparison. And we're actually, we're in the process of trying to find a constitutional lawyer, someone who does constitutional law. And I've contacted some other local people in the fitness industry so that we can split the cost. I talked to a lawyer friend of mine who does environmental law, and he said this would be expensive for one gym owner to pursue. But I've got, uh, I think I have six definites as of this morning, and I only started looking at it last night. And I think I'll probably have, you know, 10 to a dozen people that will put their name to a lawsuit, hopefully, and sue the governor and sue the state of Massachusetts to try to get open because we're looking at not being open now till mid July. And when you think, you know, constitutionally, it's like, you know, can they tell you to wear a mask? Can they tell you which way to walk on the street? Can, you know, what, how much can they do? in government before you say, okay, that's too much. And the way it's going right now, the, the overreach to me is really extreme. And initially when I read the plum stuff, it's like, right, don't bitch on social media. I get it. You know, you're going to lose some of your clients who are, you know, who might have different kind of views about civil liberties or the constitution or whatever that I do. But this now becomes a business issue in terms of we're being denied rights that are being given to other people just randomly. There's some board of whatever, you know, random advisory board guys who go out and make these decisions who really don't obviously have any idea what, you know, the different sectors of the gym business might look like. Like personal training, you can cut hair, but you can't personal train. How does that make any sense at all? And Why, is it because you're licensed, do you think? I don't think so, no, because, I mean, you know, if you're thinking it, you know, social distancing, you cannot cut hair and maintain social distancing. It is not possible. You know, maybe like, I don't know, Dennis Rodman or Shaq or somebody with six foot long arms could cut your hair and maintain social distance. But the fact of the matter is that in order to look presentable, you're going to put on a mask. I'm going to put on a mask. You're going to cut my hair and we're going to be one foot away from each other for however long it takes, 20 minutes or a half hour. Why? You know, and I'm not, I have a friend who owns a barbershop. I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to deny him his right to work either, but I don't understand. They're going to let nail salons open before they let gyms open. So there's obviously some lack of understanding of how a gym operates or some concept that, you know, maybe nobody cares about gyms. I don't know. But I think I was told the other day, and I don't know if this is true, houses of worship were one of the first things that were going to be open. And one of the reasons people said that that happened was because there was a minister in Worcester who was holding services, you know, collecting his fines, just getting fined every service and was in the process of suing the state. And people said, well, they put houses of worship in the first phase because they don't want to deal with, uh, they don't want to deal with religious lawsuits. And so, I mean, who knows, you know, I, obviously I think the more people, the more you can, show the state that you're not just going to sit there and be dictated to maybe the better it will be. I don't know. I'm not, you know, it's going to be interesting. As I said, I think, you know, there was already more civil disobedience today. There was a guy in Massachusetts who did the same thing that the guy in New Jersey did. He just opened. And it's interesting because they, people talk about the idea they can pull your license, but I don't know what license there really is to operate a gym. I don't know if I have a license. I don't know what, you know, I don't, I know I don't have any sort of state license that says, you know, license to operate a gym that somebody can take away from me. And, you know, again, I think constitutionally, but, you know, obviously once we consult with a lawyer, we'll have a better idea of where, where we need to go next, but we're going to take that step to at least, um, you know, contact a lawyer, consult with a lawyer, try to figure out, is there a constitutional challenge to this thing? Because I believe there is, I believe that they can't 
tell us? To be honest, I don't think you even need to worry about the constitutional challenge anyway. The once you start the lawsuit, like you said with the with the churches, because I know, to be honest, I know for a fact that's what happened with the private golf clubs in New York. They got they said we're good. That's it. We're here. You go. Obviously, they can have a lot of pro bono lawyers in those country clubs that were like, we're just going to sue you. Here you go. Here's the letter. And they open the the country clubs up and they're actually they can have golf lessons now, um, obviously practicing social distancing. And, you know, it's outside and it's for sure. And that, that's right. Of course, yes. I drove by the golf course in Reading where I live. Guys two feet away from each other with no masks golfing. You know what I mean? It's like, and that's the problem is that, you know, there is just that this random, and that's exactly, we heard in Massachusetts, the story was that the mask golf owners hired a lobbying firm that was connected to the governor and the next day they were open. Yeah. And you know what I mean? There's all these things that, so, you know, you have to hope that they don't want to deal with this and that their thought process is just that, you know, people are not going to organize, people are not going to, to be civilly disobedient but like for us i don't know why can't i train on the turf in the back of my place if they open parks on the 25th can i not go out on the turf with my athletes and train them well new or york not considered a park you know what i mean like what yeah you know there's yeah. all of these little loophole things and like we can't do we can't do personal training in a twenty thousand square foot gym i can't have 10 trainers and 10 clients that's a thousand square feet Per person, that's a lot of social distance. That we could social distance in our gym without masks. We could tell people masks were optional, and maintain social distance. But I don't think that would be an advisable move when you're trying to get open. Yeah. But yeah. but I'm looking when they open parks, we may just go out back and you know start some start some groups out back and see what happens. You know, worst case, you know, like I thought about it. If if it's just a fine. And they said, okay, the fine, like the fine supposedly in Massachusetts was $300 a day. I'd just pay the fine every day and just be open because, you know, we could just add in, you know, $2,000 a week into our cost of doing business. Do we want to do that? No. But would it make more sense than being closed? Yes. The problem is when they start, you know, if you've watched the, the New Jersey thing yesterday, I forget, I, I wish I had the quote in front of me, but the New Jersey governor said something about, you know, your problems will be much more significant if you try to open again tomorrow. So he was threatening them that, you know, whether that means, you know, the threat of arrest, I'm not sure what it actually means is supposedly going to happen. But he was, uh, he was clearly threatening that there would be some sort of retribution. You know, well, also in New York, there was a lot of ambiguity in what the governor had said about before, like when they're opening tennis outside. And really, he had said oh, it's, that was. Did you watch? Sorry, but did you watch the Twitter thing of the woman trying to explain the rules? No. Oh, you got to watch it. It is it is hysterical. I was in tears yesterday. In New York, I people. Yeah, I was New York talking about uh, you can play singles, but you can't play doubles. Yeah, and you and it's literally she said uh, it doesn't matter on the podcast, but it's fine. She said you can't you can't touch anybody else's tennis balls. You can kick their balls, but you can't touch their balls. And then she starts laughing and oh she can't God, stop it. And she's just giggling the whole time as she's trying to go through this. And then she's, and then she, we kept trying to say tennis balls. And then she'd revert back. She's like, you know, you can bring your own balls. If you want to mark your balls with an X, you can do that. Just bring a Sharpie and write on your balls. And it, was <laughs> like that. it was like Saturday night live, but it was legitimately the woman in New York explaining how they were opening tennis courts. But imagine Someone saying to you, no doubles. I mean, we had kids, our kids have been playing street hockey now for about two weeks, you know, as a group, no masks. And um, the cops come up to him every day and say, you're not supposed to do this. You know that, right? And the kids are all like, yep, we know. And the cops drive away. You know, no one wants to be involved in this. You know, this is the problem is that now we're in this kind of nanny state bullshit that we don't really want to be in where people are enforcing silly rules I mean, you know, it's, it's crazy, you know, there's, and, and then you can get into, obviously that there's a lot of views on COVID-19, but the reality in the state of Massachusetts, 60% of the deaths are um, nursing home patients, 60%. So of the 5,000 something, 3,000 something of them have been people in nursing homes. I think 80% have been over 70 
there have been almost zero with no without comorbidities, and there has been one child under 12. And so a lot of that stuff is, you know, when you start looking at that, I understand that they're talking about this and that it's a pandemic. But when you look at the data, the data does not support shutting the economy down. And I don't know if it ever did, but, uh, you know, I always look at it and think, and this is the problem that most people are complaining about. Everybody willingly and sort of patriotically did their job. OK, here we go. We got to shut down. All right. Everybody's going home. Everybody's going in their house for a month. And everybody did it. Nobody questioned it. Everybody said this is for the, you know, the greater good, the good of the country, you know, save lives, all that stuff. And then you get back and suddenly the politicians move the goalpost back on you and say, well, now some of you get to come out of your house and do what you want to do. And, and it's interesting because most of the people that are getting preferential treatment are major corporations, big box realtors, are big box um, retailers, people like that. And the people that are getting screwed are the local small business people. You know, if you look at it, think, why does Walmart get to be open, but a store in downtown Reading not get to be open? Why does Home Depot get to be open? You know, this idea, I mean, I can see Home Depot being essential because you need building materials. But, you know, why are there aisles open where you can buy, you know, whatever grass seed, you know, is grass seed essential right now? You know, what what becomes essential? And it's great for me because I was at Home Depot every day. I was <laughs> Buy lumber. I mean, I, I mean, I'll be honest. I was happy they were open because I was able to get the materials I needed to do the things that I was doing while I was, uh, you know, kind of riding out the pandemic. The problem is, in this situation now, like I feel like everyone feels like we did our part. Now let us get back to work because we can't. You know, you can't sit around and wait for a vaccine. That's just not realistic. One, because there may never be one, and two, because it may be a year away. And you know, there was an article. So I mean, and again. Some people will view this as political, and that's fine. And if they do, they do. If they don't, they don't. I'm not really going to. I'm at the point where I, I have to worry about my business, my employees, my customers. You know, my customers won't come if they're afraid. That's that's up to them. But almost universally, I've been talking to customers, clients almost daily. And there's a lot of people that want to get back to the gym. There's a lot of people that want to get back to working out. And as long as we can... I think respect the guidelines. I don't know why we should. I don't know why there should be a selective process. I get, you know, movie theaters, like things where you say, okay, you know, professional sporting event. All right, I get it. Movie theaters, I get it. You know, there's certain things where you think social distancing is not realistically possible. But uh, I don't think that that's gyms. And I know it's not our gym. I know it's not. I mean, when people look at it, Someone, I was talking to a doctor friend of mine the other day, and she was the one that sent me the study, the uh, South Korean study. And I sent back to her and said, no, that's, you know, that's not accurate. And I told her why. And then she said, yeah, but you're going to have, you know, you're going to have people laying on the turf. I said, no, we're not. You know, I already bought 60 yoga mats from Perform Better. Everybody will get their own mat when they come in. And every mat will be sanitized after that person uses it to warm up. And then they'll be up on their feet. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like, you know, they'll bring their mat with them till they're done. If they have to lay down again, they'll roll their mat back. You know what I mean? We'll, like we'll be able to, we'll be able to do way, way more. And if you look at, like you said, you saw the Tennessee guidelines. Most people went so far over and above what the, the guidelines that were released yesterday. They were like, yeah, we already thought of all of that, like all that stuff and more, will be taken care of in our plan to get reopened because we knew that we were going to get, you know, the seven labors of Hercules thrown at us to try to be reopened. But it's the arbitrary nature of it that we're now concerned with and hopefully like i said hopefully today i find the name of a constitutional lawyer and we can retain this guy and get the ball rolling hopefully he can relatively quickly get to a court because all you really need i think is an injunction that says they can't keep you closed and then you have to wait for a hearing and then a judge has to decide hopefully the lawyer does a good job of arguing you know why can you get a haircut but not go to a gym yeah, and also, I think the, the biggest problem is they're putting us in, like, you're saying all this stuff, but people on the outside, they don't, they just think of, of Jane Fonda classes where everybody's on a stepper and, you know, 30, three inches away from each other. Like, when I did, we did, I got 15 to 16 gym owners together in New York, and we based all, we did the Tennessee guidelines, and I actually did a couple of the Massachusetts the petitions, I used some of their language to start it about, we believe smaller independent facilities 
we can take the appropriate measures to ensure safety of our employees and customers. And so basically everybody's p- putting us into these small gyms into the big, big, and even you guys, you guys are big, but you're not doing these group classes where everybody's three inches away from each other. So uh, yeah. the first thing that we said on the document was we're going to restrict facility access to appointment based one trainer to one person training only and limit facility occupancy to 25% of capacity as dictated by the fire code, which is fine for every single one. Because anybody, I don't know what 25% of your capacity is, but you probably don't have a lot of people, that many people in there a lot of times. And what you're proposing, you certainly don't have 25% of capacity. Yeah. I don't know what, I don't even know if we have a fire code because we have so much square footage. I don't know if we have a, an actual number. But the difference for us, we were talking about 10 people per room initially, which would mean about, well, actually it would be- Five people, five most, trainers? It would be, well, no, I mean, if we had groups, it would be 20 people in 10,000 square feet. Yeah, that's So, nice. you know what I mean? So you start looking at that. I mean, that's, you know, it's 500 square feet per person. No, it's not, sorry, that's a lie. Yeah, 10 people, 5,000, yeah. 10 people, 500 square feet, 5,000, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's 500 square feet a person. Yeah, I mean, that's a plan of- you know, right, I mean, it's ridiculous because I, I started figuring out today, because you know me, I'm one of these, you know, I'm an overanalyzer. The, the sphere, you need 144 square feet to have six foot social distancing on either side. Because what you end up having is a 12 by 12 square, right? You know what I mean? If you, if you just eliminate the person in the middle and say, okay, you know, six, if, if saying that, you know, so if you said 150 square feet, you'd be way more than, you know, that person could literally move in their bubble the whole time without ever bumping into other people. And what I'm finding, we went to a party the other night. No one's, people aren't afraid, at least not the people I'm encountering. Because they realize that, you know, we're not, I mean, our risk, I should be the most, I always say I should be the most afraid because I am the closest to what would be considered, a, you know, the high risk age being 60. But most of the people that I'm around who are in their 40s and 50s are are literally not like not thinking about it. You're going to get some people, but it, you're, you're not. Uh, I don't think there's nearly as many that are as concerned about it as the government wants us to think. I agree. I agree. Uh, a lot of people are polling their members and they're, they're finding that that same thing. There's still a small portion, but they're going to eventually come back. And I think once it's like the water, like the ocean, you ever go to the ocean and you, you know, you see a couple of people like nobody's in the water. I'm not going in yet. Once a couple of people go in, you're like, all right, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> like, so I think that's really a similar uh, 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 feeling to me. I would agree. All right, coach. Well, good luck with that. And um, wow, this is uh, some interesting times and we're going to yeah, we'll keep us close. But I never thought I'd be in, I never thought I'd be concerned with constitutional law. So there you go. And I agree with you. It's not political, it's business. So coach, until next time. Thanks, Dan. All right, guys, right now at Perform Better, they got free shipping on orders over $49. Restrictions do apply, so check it out. There's certainly plenty of stuff on sale as well, so you can double dip. They've also become an important resource for the lockdown. So they got a whole video series on protecting and saving your business with people like Rick Mayo, Frank Nash, the Cosgroves, so many really good videos. They also have a a section where they have um, some home home workout videos. So check out performbetter.com for all their products and info on their educational offerings. All right, now it's time for the Result Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. And I'm here with Alan Cosgrove. Alan, thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me, Annie. Because I got some time on my hands right now because we're still not open. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So everybody knows now you're still not open. You guys are in California. Obviously, you were told. Now, what is, I know in New York, for example, gyms are right now, and we're trying to change that, but right now we're in phase four, which we're in our region. We aren't even in phase one, and so we're looking at phase one possibly being in mid-June, and each phase is two weeks long. So if it's mid-June, that means gyms won't open till August 1st. What's your status in California with all that? 
So California, there were three stages. Phase one was when we were in lockdown and we're now in phase two. And now I believe this is the third or third week of phase two. And now we're moving into stage two of phase two, which is entirely frustrating because I didn't realize there was going to be multiple stages. Yeah. Gyms are in phase three. Um, the, the party line coming out of the state of California is that we will not be driven by dates. We will be driven by science and data. They don't actually announce what that science and data is, but they're not given an end to, to anything. Basically, we're locked down indefinitely. Uh, recently, they did talk about, um, this is the first time I've heard anybody talking about this, is they're looking at a ratio of positive tests to tests. Because if I tell you we have a thousand positive tests today, without any relevance as to how many we tested, that doesn't mean anything. If I have zero and we tested zero, that doesn't mean anything either. Yeah. Uh, so that and the idea of dividing the state up by county seems to be taking some uh, some sort of momentum. So so who knows it. I, I see a lot of places opening up. I see a lot of places going rogue. And I understand everybody's position and their rights to do so. And is this constitutional? Like I... I not a politician or an epidemiologist. Right now, results fitness are going with what we're told we can do, right? So that that's kind of where we're at. So hope, right now, we are still uh, completely remote training right now and renting out of equipment. All right. So you guys just did something that I, I was actually on the phone with somebody from Florida on Friday, a gym owner, and he was asking some advice. And I said, you know, really, you should survey your members because they're the ones you know you everybody's like everybody's membership like the guy in new jersey his his crew like they're a li they're probably a little bit more conservative so defying the law and doing this social the um you know the civil disobedience stuff might work well if you know your demographic, it's going to work yeah. well in Ohio, in 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 Middle America for sure. But you you do have to know your demographic. I told Ken, I said, Ken, you know, just survey your people. You guys did that. Talk to us about the survey that you did. Yeah, so I'm big on that uh, too, Anthony. Is that I I don't like uh, one of my coaching members is saying, no, oh, there does uh, there seems to be a, a risk uh, of increased transmission during exercise, so maybe we won't open, and and perhaps that's there their uh, opinion, I'm big on trying to look at what does the data actually say. And there was a study came out about um, running and it would be, uh, you could transmit it more. And then it was actually revealed that it was actually a computational flow dynamics uh, example from a physics professor in engineering. It wasn't a study, it wasn't anything. It just was an idea that he was suggesting, because he's a cyclist, that you stagger behind each other and don't sit in the slipstream. So I'm trying to go with real science, right? And one of those things for real science is let's not speculate what your members want. Let's send them a questionnaire and ask them to fill it out and tell them what we want. So we did it real simple on Google Docs, and we sent it out to our active uh, email list, now our, our active member list, I'm sorry, because some members are frozen, some members are have left us or whatever, right? um, some are you know, just not active. So we wanted to do it with members that were really using what our services are and still in contact with us. So we got about 132 responses. And I'm just going to share with everybody the questions that we asked and the responses we got. We got about 50% of our active members, I believe, maybe just a little more than that, to respond to this, which has been good. But what's interesting is, and I was just saying to you before the call, from the first few people who filled it out, the percentage response of things hasn't really changed. So I'm comfortable this is a good snapshot of my entire membership base. So question number one was your full name. Because I, I want to know, I, if somebody didn't fill it out, they could put in a fake name if they want, I'm sure. But I wanted to know who was saying what, right? I wanted to know each person's feelings. And question number two, um, we, oh, this is the one we messed up in the beginning. We said, have you been using any of our results everywhere remote coaching services? And originally, we had six responses. Yes, I use the app and I check in with my coach. Yes, I, lo I love the streaming Zoom workouts. Yes, I've stayed engaged in the Facebook group. 
I've been enjoying all of the above or one, I've been doing my own thing and can't wait to get back in person. And we had other and a huge percentage of people took other oh. and wrote in something that was one of the above five. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that made the analysis of that uh, pretty hard. Part of what we did of this, and this is for, for the business of fitness, I was reminding people of all the things we're doing right now. We've got the app. We've got streaming classes. We've got a Facebook group. We've got a call with your coach. Just to remind them, hey, you may not be using all of this, but we're doing, still doing a lot of stuff. So there was a reason for that. But also there's some people like, I'm doing my own thing. And I'm like, all right, you care enough to have responded to our uh, questionnaire but you're not actually doing anything, I'll be honest, that's someone who's ready to leave, right? Yeah. So that identifies those and we're able to jump in and, and target those people. But what we, we were able to find is that uh, we had 22% right now who have been doing their own thing uh, and can't wait to get back in person, which means of the respondees, 78% are engaged online, which is you know, a pretty cool thing. Number three, this is another business thing. We only have six questions. Number three was, would you, could, we'd love to have a testimonial sharing your experience with our results everywhere services. And we got a whole bunch of amazing testimonials. So it's a great time just to collect that because these clients are very grateful for what you're doing. So also if somebody doesn't want to give you a testimonial, they'll use that spot to let you know. And we didn't have anything like that, but that was that's a powerful business move is to get your ask right then for a testimonial as to what you've been doing right now. And some of them are really powerful there. When you're having a bad day, this is the section you want to go and read and cheer yourself <laughs> up. So question four is how soon will you be comfortable uh, coming back once restrictions are lifted? So this was a surprise because you don't know, right? Until you ask your clients. So we had immediately open, open, open. Within a few weeks, within a few months, I'm happy with the remote coaching. Not until there is a vaccine. I'm happy continuing remote indefinitely. And I'm not sure yet. So again, we had a mistake because we had other where people would tell me a story that would fit into one of these boxes, which is fine. But that gives me a, a look at, um, it makes me a little harder for me to, to translate the data. Right, so we actually removed that uh, towards the end of our survey, and what we had is that uh, there's 20% who are not sure yet, right? Who they're waiting. There's 58% who are ready immediately to open, right? And that number has nice. surfed between about 62 and 56. It hasn't changed real dramatically, but we have a few people, but 11% who will wait a few weeks. They're going to wait to see. And we've got a couple of people who are just like, not until there's a vaccine. Now, only a few of those, only two or three of those, but that's a very real, real crowd, right? And then what we did is we surveyed times that uh, if, we, if we had to have limited capacity, what two times uh, would be best for you to return. Uh, that one, again, is a little skewed because some people are out of work. Um, and it's, you know, it does change it uh, a, a little bit. Uh, but of all our responses, we got eight who are like, I'm not going to be returning in person right now. Right? So I, I've said this at the beginning with you. I think there'll be some challenges when we reopen. It won't be business as usual or business as before. It'll be us. Uh, it'll be a different thing. We're going to have different challenges when we, when we reopen. Yeah. And then our last th question, we said, are there any specific requests or concerns that you have? about returning to results fitness or anything else you'd like to share. And some were like, is ma are masks going to be mandatory? And I'll tell you my, I'll, I'll give you my personal opinion is if masks restrict the virus, and I'll, I'll say the science seems, I don't know, middle of the, the road on this, you can find things either side, but if it does restrict the virus, it's definitely going to restrict airflow, which could be a problem with vigorous exercise. So I see some of the change saying, you're going to have to wear a mask apart from when you're doing vigorous exercise. Um, I've got really the people that responded to that and it wasn't big. Some are like, I won't come back unless there's masks. And some are like, I'm not coming back if there's masks. That would be too much challenge for me. Uh, so right now, until there's a state mandate on that, I suspect Results Fitness will have a, a masks are optional. 
right? I'm, I'm also, I'm very keen from speaking on this as the business of fitness segment is that when you're allowed to reopen, it's important to follow the guidelines of your state, but it's also important to not restrict yourself and make less money for even longer and hurt your company financially when it's not necessary. So that was kind of a, of a, a mix for us. And, uh, but in general, the, the, uh, surprise for me is I was the same as your friend. Everyone's ready to come back. Well, there's, there's a 20% who are not sure. And there's 11% who it will be a few weeks. And there's a percentage of, you know, a one and a half percent who like, I, I might stay remote, uh, for the foreseeable future. So the, the real reason for this is not to listen to my percentages. We're in Santa Clara, California. If I did this survey in Wisconsin, it may be completely different. If I did it in New York City, it may be completely different. But what I don't want anybody to do is to make your reopening plans or base your projections on your own personal opinion because you are not your client. You are not your target market. So, yeah, a big percentage of clients are in our area are ready to come back and open. But it's it's really only if we were to open, we've had 50% of our people fill out that survey and it's 60% of them who are willing to come back So uh, right away. That business wouldn't be immediately sustainable. Does that make sense? Yeah. The numbers aren't there, right? Yeah. So it's it's just getting this clarity from your your uh, members. And we emailed it out to them and we put it in our Facebook group and then we mentioned it everywhere we could uh, to try to get as many uh, responses as we could. <clears throat> so no real... Uh, major surprises. Um, one thing that might be useful to know is there's a, a percentage who cared enough to fill out our form who are not using any of our remote coaching services. I, I would say that's someone who there's a limited client lifetime with those people. Like before, they're like, I'm, I'm not using anything. I'll come back later. I'll cancel and come back. So we want to reach out to them and get them back in. And the part is not everybody be ready to come right back in. We also explained in this this uh, letter, this email, how we planned that it would look, like our proposal of 45-minute workouts with a cleaning 50 minutes in between, restrict no sharing of equipment, people training in what we were calling pods, so we'd move the, everything they'd need for their workout into the one area. And that there are some members who are like, well, that's like, that's once you get back to normal training, I'll come back. I, I'm not interested in training like that. So I think that's our assumption is we're they're all coming back no matter what we offer. That part is 100% not going to be true. Yeah. If you're going to offer something different, if you've been doing small group and you want to do one-on-one -on -one, or you're changing the length of the time, you, you may not have everybody coming back. So moral of the story is you're going to find out some things that you didn't know and it's going to change how you're going to going to operate your business. Uh, so we did it real simple. There's a whole bunch of ways to do a survey out there. We did it on Google Docs, uh, and it was just real simple. It does the analysis for you. Make your choices on each thing simple so that the stats are easy to analyze. They like don't have more than a, a few options. But get, get some real data. Right? Get some real information uh, that, that will help you see what your actual people are looking for. The, the assumption that as soon as I open, my members are going to rush in. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not completely surprised, although I thought it would be a little higher that they're ready to go. From, from talking to them and interacting with them, they're all, I thought they'd all be ready to go right away. But the one um, caveat to that is we're not allowed to reopen yet. So some people may be responding based on the current uh, political climate. So yeah. they may be like, I'm not ready until they say yeah. they're ready, right? I so, think it, uh, I, that, I that, use, is, that is going to change it, right? Yeah, I think it's like the analogy I was using with Mike today was, it's like going in the ocean. Some people, if you go to the ocean in the morning and there's nobody in it, you might not go in, you might be a little afraid. Then a bunch of people are coming in, they're swimming, and you're like, okay, yeah, I can go in now. You know, once they yeah. see some other people, it's like a restaurant. You don't normally don't go into restaurants that are empty. Uh, it's the same thing. I think. I think you know. Once once people feel confident when the government, when the governor is saying it's safe to go back, when people are saying, "Okay, we're doing this, we're doing that," those those answers might might be different. But uh, great job with that, Alan. Love yeah, it. And I think it's as, as you touched on. Uh, one of my uh, consulting clients in in Utah 
Epic Fitness, they reopened and some clients were not comfortable with reopening, but came by to pick up supplements or something. And then they saw the gym reasonably yeah. busy and they saw how they were doing it. And they're like, you know what? I'm, I'm ready now to come back. Like now that I, I see what it is, but yeah, it's a, uh, it's right on. It's, um, I, I'm, a at my personal opinions aside, um, whatever stance you take against the governors, against your state, if you stay against it, some people are going to back you. If you're with them, some people are going to back you. So the, be concerned with your reputation overall before you make any de decisions, but it shouldn't be your decision. You should be looking at, at that of your members. So uh, I agree with you. Uh, surveys are, are key. And hey, as more people fill out my survey, if there's any dramatic changes, and I don't expect there will be, uh, I'll, I'll hit you up, Anthony, and we can go over it again. All right, Alan, thanks for doing this, and uh, we will talk to you next time. Hey, this is Adam. This is Tim. Welcome to the Train Hook Data Driven Coaching segment. Let's get so, it. I think today Tim and I want to put on our athlete hats because, you know, uh, I bet you didn't know, but we also train as well as training other people. And, I'm a washed uh, up athlete, you know, so yeah. reminiscing. Now, now we're a couple months into this, uh, you know, quarantine thing. And yeah. uh, we have some observations, particularly Tim, because he has kind of the, the Spartan setup and I'm fortunate enough to have some, some equipment available to me. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. So Tim, tell me a little bit about, uh, how you stay motivated to keep training. Cool. So I think it's important to note that, um, you know, for me, my focus changed a little bit more from like strength, you know, for me, motivation came in the form of adding plates, like adding load to, you know, to, to the exercise I was doing recently, as Adam pointed out, I'm in a more of an archaic style of training where I got some cinder blocks and elevated bench and, and for me, it's about, you know, how can I feel progress? How can I make progress without that standard feeling of, you know, being surrounded by the, all these bodybuilders and, um, you know, throwing weight on the bar? It's tough. You know, it's a tough transition. Um, for me, you know, it came, it, it comes across as, you know, pretty standard, Adam. And I think the forgotten younger brother in this conversation of progressive overload, which is like adding just volume, right. With the same, the same load. So we're not, you don't have to throw a bunch of cinder blocks on my back to make sure I'm getting better. I can increase my volume. And if I can track that and measure it over time, I know I'm making progress and that makes me feel good because I know when I get back into the gym, I'm not going to look like a laggard compared to everyone else. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think you, you made a really good point there, which is, you know, when we're in the gym and we've, we've got, you know, all the weight in the world available to us. Yeah you know, adding weight to the bar is kind of like the single best way to ensure that you're training harder and also, also like make sure the stimulus is good yeah. too, stronger. It feels right? good too. You know what I mean? It feels good. Yeah. It's, it's cool. It's fun yeah. to add stuff, add weight to the bar. Exactly. Uh, you know, I also do that kind of training, you know, this, this kind of like volume progression, mm -hmm. you know, by adding reps. And then once you get to a certain number of reps, you add weight, that kind of thing. Sure. Yeah. Pepper style programs are my thing a lot of times yeah. for myself. Um, but yeah, so like, I think that that's a pretty interesting way. Like, so you'll do like your three sets of split squats, whatever I think it was. Yeah. And you just like kind of progress the reps over time. Yeah, exactly. What do you do when you get to a certain threshold then, if you, you don't have any more weight? That's a, that's a great question. So like, yeah, I do a lot of rear foot elevated split squats. Obviously I can't step under a barbell looking for that lower body strength. And um, there's a ton of ways to get that done. That's my preferred way. But if I get to somewhere and I've got two cinder blocks, you know, I'm holding on to them and I can't go anywhere maybe it's time to switch it up to like how fast I'm right. So like my, my neighbor, I live in an apartment, my neighbor next, uh, underneath moved out. So now I can really move that split squat with body weight and even jump off the floor a little bit. So if I can move it progressively faster, you know, I know that I'm making progress, you know, moving from loaded to loaded to, to an explosive movement. Yeah. Um, that's a, that brings up another good point, which is I know my temptation when you know uh equipment is scarce yeah is to include a lot more variety i think because my perception is people are going to get bored yeah um and i think that's that's just a tendency of mine that i have to fight a little bit and yeah. it's not really even necessary or you, you like you just said like you just use the same movement you have yeah. different loading and velocity strategies or tempos that kind of thing sure um you know what oh. I, I do do sometimes is you know, I'll alternate kind of weeks, like if Monday, you know, the Monday session 
you know, they did one version of push-ups on, on one week. Next week, I might give them a different one. The yeah. next week, we're back to the first one. So by that point, they sh- you know, th- if those two things feed into each other, they should be able to do a little more, that kind of thing. Absolutely. I, I'm a big fan of variation. You know, my personal training, and Adam, we differ a little bit in that, is, is, you know, you're very consistent. I'm like a madman. I'm like changing stuff all the time, stealing ideas from people. But I think there comes a point to where, you know, part of the motivating factor is getting excited to like maybe excel a movement or get to a new movement or a new variation of, of, of a movement. You know what I mean? And I think that from a, putting my coaching hat back on really important for my athletes and my gen pop folks and taking my coaching hat off. How exciting is it to learn something new and to actually find measurable progress in something new? Sure. So, I mean, that's where subjective feedback could come in like video um, yeah. where when you're satisfied with the quality of that movement, maybe you, you allow the person to be to graduate to a different one. Yeah. Um, that's another strategy. You know, we've, we've heard about that, especially with people who are pretty novice athletes, like sure. some schools or, uh, or sport performance centers will have this system of kind of like of, of graduating people through uh, different movements. Yeah, absolutely. Progress is different from person to person. Talk to your people and, and find something you can measure over time. That's it, man. That's going to do it for us today. Go to trainrock.com to start your 14-day free trial. Uh, you know, we actually have new pricing in there. Uh, you can get started for as low as $9.99 a month. Uh, we also have a couple of at-home programs to help you get started super easy. So go and check it out. Hey, this is Greg Cook, and I've been talking about corrective exercise and some of the things we need to be aware of. And I'm really going back to the drawing board with a lot of the, the ways we can create even more user-friendly correctives. Correctives work, but there, there's an art and a skill to some correctives, and some correctives are much more user-friendly, both for trainers with less experience and therapists with less experience and, and, and clients who need to do it themselves sometimes. So we're constantly looking for ways to create these these resets of movement. And we call those corrective exercise. And I started realizing a long time that what our instructors do when they're coaching a single leg deadlift or a half kneeling chopper lift or half Turkish get up or something on a balance beam is they're really running three different lesson plans at the same time. And I memorize these by the ABCs, awareness, breathing, and control. And I've been talking about the awareness that we need to do by putting somebody in a challenging situation, but don't offer them the help. You should have scaled the challenge so they've got to struggle just a little bit. But if they sort of get better as they do it and become more aware of certain things, it accomplished what it needed to do. Once you show them something that they're not too good at, you now have an opportunity to see if you can adjust their breathing simply so they can appreciate simply controlling my state of readiness in my breath gave me a little more mobility or a little more motor control or a little better movement. So that awareness and that breathing need to be set. And now we come to the C control. And I've been using a half foam roll for a long, long time to do toe touch progressions, toes up, touch your toes, toes down, touch your toes. And we start doing different combinations of that, simply changing the earth under you by biasing you in plantar flexion or dorsiflexion. But when we go up the kinetic chain, that's what we call a perturbation. It's going to throw you off balance and cause you to react. Okay. Your unconscious reactions to stay upright and maintain balance and stuff will override anything I tell you to do. Well, we got a big old redneck here telling you to touch your toes, but for the first time in your life, you're standing uphill. How am I going to work this out? Well, your body's not going to let you fall, but your pride wants you to touch your toes. And I slow you down right there. And I said, listen, man, permission to cheat, bend your knees, keep your feet together. Uh, Do me a favor exhale as you're going down. Now we could do other things like overpressurize and everything, but if I can get you to your toes with a, Hey man, take it easy, relax, cheat, bend your knees and exhale. And you're there. Then all I'll say is now when you come stand up, you're going to lose your balance probably. So make sure you do it slow and controlled. And why don't we do it on an inhale? That inhale will actually create intra-abdominal pressure and keep you from hyperextending at any one part of your back because you've got a big old belly full of air. And it's like trying to dent a stability ball. It's going to offer us some stability. So inhale on the way up. Up, exhale on the way down. But the whole time, we've already got the awareness of what the problem was. We've already offered some breathing cues and sequence. And now the only obstacle they've got is toes up, toes down, or some variation of that. And as Ryan Holiday says in his book, The Obstacle is the Way, 
the obstacle's already there. Trainer, therapist, chiropractor, strength coach, get the hell out of the way. You're sitting there saying, slow down and breathe, slow down and breathe. Find your center, find your center, slow down and breathe. So a lot of people have a broken breath sequence. A lot of people rush when they're off balance. The broken breath sequence is a compounding problem. It gets worse the more you do. And people who start rushing when they're off balance usually end up falling. So those two cues force them into more postural motor control and a more synced breath at the same time. And it's absolutely so simple that I think most of us feel we have a hard time charging people to give them something that simple. But it's not. You set up an awareness in breathing situation that allowed this control to happen. Now, here's how you play the trick. Go back to the movement screen or balance test that sent you down this path, that sent you down this little challenge and do an immediate retest, that test retest. Because when we're working corrective exercise, you're going for response, not adaptation. There's no time for set principle to occur here. All we're doing is tweaking the app of toe touch or tweaking the app of squat, tweaking the app of balance. And in doing that, you're making adjustments to the brain and to the person's awareness and the way they're going to breathe when they start feeling stress and tension. Now, what do most athletes do? What do most patients do? Most clients do when they feel stress and tension? They immediately tighten up. They immediately basically fight that or resist that with their body. What if we remove that signal and said, cleanse that breath, start again. You can stop any set. The minute a bad rep occurs, I would rather blow the whole set than try to spend four reps getting back on track. So awareness, breathing, and control sets you up for the next in the ABCs. And I want to talk about development next time. All right, now time for the Body by Boyle online.com. Hit the gym with the strength coach segment. Become an insider to Mike Boyle Strength Conditioning with staff meetings, in-services, and complete access to the MBSC programs. Check it out at bodybyboyleonline.com. All right. Today, I've been waiting for this for a while, longer than most people would think, because I've known this gentleman for a long time, and we met in 2000, November of 2007, I attended the Phase 2 Athletes Performance, now known as Exos Mentorship, and I gotta say, I got there, I was a little disappointed when I first got there, there was a young man who was going to be heading up the whole thing, Mark Verstegen was was really not going to be a huge part of it, so I was going to say I was a little disappointed. Uh, about an hour into it, I was no longer disappointed. Uh, Nick Winkleman was the guy teaching most of this mentorship, which was a huge thing, it's all week, guys, it wasn't just a couple hours, and uh, I had such an amazing week that I... I think that Saturday I emailed Mark Verstegen and, and I told him, wow, Mark, this, this guy is amazing. I couldn't believe how he handled this thing all by himself and just the level, the passion. And this before he even, by his own admission, really became a, a good coach. Um, but we're going to talk more about that. Um, and so Nick and I kept in touch and I got him to to do an interview. Our first real interview was in February, 2008. It wasn't for the strength coach podcast. It was for strengthcoach.com. We talked about APs, uh, their, what their core methodology. And so, uh, it wasn't until February of 2009. I mean, this is a long time ago that I asked them to do an eight part series on the AP methodology. So if anybody wants to hear that, it, we started on episode 28 we put them all together on episode 35.5. That was in May of 2009. And I had started a website called Strength and Conditioning Webinars. This is before I owned strengthcoach.com. But Nick did a couple webinars for me and we had always kept in touch. And he had asked me, and there's an important lesson here, by the way, the answer to every unasked question is no. You have to go out there. You have to ask people for things. You have to take a chance on this. And Nick had said to me in one of our conversations, he's like, Aunt, because he was always calling me to ask me, what are people asking for? What are they looking for? What do they want to learn? He always wanted to provide content that was valuable. And so we had started having this conversation. He had asked me, he said, Aunt, how, well, how can I be out there more? How can I be part of strengthcoach.com more? Strength Conditioning Webinars and the Strength Coach Podcast. And I came up with this idea because 
it was going to make me money. And I was doing <laughs> segments and, and I, and I wanted to get, I was like, I want to partner with Nick and athletes performance because the, I loved everything they were doing. I loved everything Nick was doing and everything that he was talking about, nobody else was talking about. So I had said, Nick, you're, you keep talking about all these coaching ideas. And the problem is, is that in the past, we never had a place to put this. Everybody was always saying, for the most part, you have to get experience. You just got to get experience. There's no books on this. And Nick started, we started the art of coaching in April, almost to the day it's May right now, but uh, April of 2011, we started, I got Mark Verstegen to come on first because he was a little bit of a bigger name at the time. I don't know about it anymore, but that's <laughs> kidding. <laughs> uh, no, but we started with Mark and then Nick started what was our, our segment called the art of coaching that was started by Nick and I, we came up with this idea to, to get him on uh, really every show. And we started that. If anybody wants to hear the first one from Nick, it's episode 78. It's a long time ago, but, um, wow. but I'm really proud of him. And I've been able to see this trans not transformation because he was always amazing. Uh, like everything that he did, the passion, everything. And his, his, ed the, what he was doing in terms of education and teaching people, uh, it was just really ahead of its time. So the book language of coaching, I got it a couple of weeks ago. I'm really not, I'm not finished with it yet. It's an amazing book. It's really drawn me in there's visually, everything is amazing about it. Nick, congratulations. And thanks so much for coming on, man. Thank you. Ant. It, this is, um, this is probably as close to a religious experience as one can have to think about where we started to be talking about this now. I mean, literally you've, you've chronicled, the journey all along the way, you know, in, in the podcast world. And so it's an absolute privilege, man. Yeah. And, and again, congratulations on, on the book, because I know how much you put into things. It's not just putting it out there. I know how hard it is just to do a regular book. This book broke the mold visually <laughs> too. It really did. And what we were talking about, you're practicing what you're preaching here. It's a language of coaching. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of technical stuff in here in the beginning that I think is really important to read. Somebody can get this book and really go to page 195 and basically just get the cues, or as you say, just get the fish. We'll give you the fish. <laughs> and, but you want to learn how to fish as well. And the beginning, it, you could get lost if somebody else is writing this because you've done an amazing job of pulling me in visually, pulling me in with stories, pulling me in with examples and analogies. So just a great job at this. Yeah. We tried to, you know, when you look at teaching something, you almost kind of go you know, whole part whole. And that's, I didn't think of it that way when I started writing it, but if you actually go in and for those of you that, that are, or will read it now that I give you this pattern, you'll see it. But basically, I start every section with a story that tries to draw you in and illustrate the concept or the problem or the principle. And then we get into, okay, now that we have that, what, what's behind the curtain, so to speak? Wh where's the wizard? And that's the detail, Ant, that you're referring to. And even there, I try to keep it as, as simple as you can, no simpler, because I, ultimately, I am trying to teach people something. But then we pull you right out of the depths right when you feel you can't hold your breath any longer, we, we pull you right on out and, and back to the, the shallow, back to the superficial, and we finish with a story, an illustration, a, a summation that is sticky in the mind. And even if you don't remember the detail, you'll have the concept on which the detail is, is based. And it's that concept that we want to bring to influence our athletes and our clients. Absolutely. And I, I got to say, I right now, obviously, we're in the quarantine. And I am just dying to go and <laughs> use this. I got a couple of hockey players and I, I almost went up the other day to their house. Three hockey players are, are that they're, they're training at one of the kids house. And I just wanted to go over there and start to use some of the things that I'm learning. So good stuff. But Nick, I want you to start out. I know you've told the story a billion times, but we have to start out with this about where this light bulb went off, because to me, this book is really about that white whale for every strength coach, movement coach, performance coach, whatever. And that's the elusive transferability is what we're doing in the gym going to transfer to the playing field or life. Yeah. And, and really that's where you 
again, being a perfectionist and being never satisfied, that's what happened to you and made you, took you on a deeper journey to get better. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, I, I tried <clears throat> just an anecdote. It was important for me to tell, tell the, the story, the journey that I went on to learn this stuff. Because the last thing I want anyone who reads the book to think is, oh, th this guy just had an affinity for cueing and external cueing and analogy. I didn't. I, I was not good at that stuff. I was the hyper-technical cure, over-cure, all that stuff. And so it's important for me to, to share that journey, to share the white whale, as, as you're saying, because I think people will relate to it. And I want people to know that, that I went on this journey, and I want you to join me on the journey. And because I was first down the path, it should make your path a little bit easier, but it's still going to require some work. But hey, here's the tools to get you along the way. And so just as, as a footnote, I feel that's important to share. Um, so yeah, so part one of the book opens with, with a story, if you would, the catalyst, the spark for where all this really manifested. And we got to go back to the same year that I did the podcast with you. In fact, I started doing the podcast. I don't know if I've ever told you this after this story, right? A lot of this began right after the 2009 NFL Combine, when I had gone through this somewhat of a transformative career-altering experience. And so I think that's an interesting anecdote to share as well, if people go back and listen to those. But it was 2009, and I had finally gotten the tap on the shoulder to take over the NFL Combine Development Program at Exos. And I took this program over from the likes of the Joe Gomes, the Derelettos, the Luke Richardsons, the Ken Croners of the world. Uh, all of those names, whether or not you know them, had gone on to coach in the NFL successfully from a strength conditioning perspective. Luke Richardson went on to win a Super Bowl with, uh, with, with Denver. So these individuals who I took the program over for had established a legacy of success, taking players from college putting them through an eight-week NFL Combine boot camp, and then supporting them as they went to Indianapolis and performed, and as we said, the biggest interview of their life. And no one is under any illusion that the NFL Combine is the end-all, be-all when it comes to draft status. But we all know that if you're up against three other, for example, defensive backs in your position, and you all come from similar caliber schools, and you all have similar caliber statistics, will the NFL Combine operate as a tiebreak? Will the NFL Combine operate as a second look or a deeper look? Absolutely, which is why players and agents continue to pay top dollar to go to these training facilities to prepare their players for this interview that happens every year at the end of February. And so... I had observed this firsthand for, for three years. And so when I finally got the tap on the shoulder, I was ready to go. I knew the program inside and out. I knew how those coaches coached it. And I was going to go in and just absolutely be the loudest echo of those great coaches I could. And so I went in. And the context here is this. For those of you that are familiar with Exos, the facility, second to none. Like we had everything we needed. We suffered for zero. We had the space. We had the equipment. The program, as I had articulated, was written by some of the best strength coaches to this day I've ever come across. So I knew the facility, the context, and what I was coaching was spot on. The only new variable in the mix was named Nick Winkleman. And so my goal year one was simply to not screw it up. And we had all the statistics. So we knew what that average improvement should be for things like the 40-yard dash, the vertical jump, and the broad jump. So I had a standard, an expectation, a standard bearer that I had to bring forward. I didn't want to taint that legacy that they had built. And so I went in with hyper detail, dotted I's, cross T's, everything was surgical precision, uh, military timekeeping. I was not going to screw this thing up. And I had a whole bunch of interns around me, and I was flying. I mean, I thought I was everything. I was the, I was the, 
the, the best thing since sliced bread, as they say. But there was a moment. There was a moment. And it was a fleeting moment, but one that has fundamentally changed the course of how I coach. And it was late January, so it was still kind of chilly in the morning uh, in Phoenix. It was Monday. And so we had a linear speed session, an acceleration session, and we were on the track. I can see it now as clear as I see the room around me. We were on the track going through our, our basic warm-up drills. So that's your, your A skips, your pop float skip, so on and so forth. And I'm standing on the side of the track. We're going three guys at a time, and we're three to four lines deep. There was about you know eight to 10, eight to 12 guys per group. And I'm coaching, like I'm coaching before the movement, get tall, knees up, snap off the ground. I'm coaching during the movement, pop, snap, hip, pop, boom. I mean, any word that could kind of give a little bit of rhythm was coming out of my mouth. And then I was throwing feedback at them as a group and as an individual as they were coming back. And this is how I had coached and, and how I had continued to coach to that point. But all of a sudden, there was like this moment. And this moment was in my mind. It's like I had been staring at this digital virtual mental program that said this movement, then that movement, then that movement, and these cues before, and these cues during, and these cues afterwards. It's like I was some kind of AI automaton. And I had already I've already articulated here how important the program was. So I was just, I was invested in the program, Ant. And in that moment, it was like I was snapped to reality. And all of a sudden, in my mind, I looked up and looked out, almost like for the first time. And I saw like, wow, there's people in front of me. These are living, breathing, moving individuals, all with different bodies, backgrounds, preferences, and likes and dislikes. But yet here I am, almost like I'm freaking reading off a script, chucking out machine gun cues before, during, and after. And as I walked away from that Monday morning, I didn't know what the solution was, Ant. I, I didn't know what it was, but I knew something had to change. And so for, for the remaining month of the NFL Combine, I just tried to observe myself. I knew that if I tried to change in that moment, I would fail. And so I just critically observed myself, knowing that when this NFL Combine was over, I'd be able to bank all those observations and then with the luxury of time, critically analyze them to see where I possibly went wrong or didn't go wrong because we, we hadn't gotten to the NFL Combine. Yeah. Okay. So fast forward, another month is under the belt. We get on the plane. We fly to Indianapolis. I'm through the roof. I'm so excited. The people who were there with me year one, I, I was like a bull in a china shop just pacing and so we wait the three days as the guys go through their medicals and whatnot. We're finally to day four, and there's four days on the hop, all on NFL Network, as most people know. And I've got computer out with my video from pre and post testing. And then I also have an Excel file open with pre and post testing results. And so fast forward, all my guys run, and I am pissed. Like, I am properly fuming, pissed off. And it's not because they hadn't improved. In fact, I got thank yous from everyone. The agents were like, hey, man, pat on the back. You didn't screw it up, rookie. And, you know, all my colleagues said, hey, you know, could have this been better, that been better. But, hey, you towed the line. You preserved the legacy for another year. Good job. You should be proud. And there was no lack of scrutiny on this. And so the external optic around me was that we had won. We had succeeded. But the internal optic was one of absolute dismal failure. And here's why. When I looked at the results at the NFL Combine, I did not see our players in outcome or process of executing the movements technically perform as well as they had in Phoenix, Arizona. So you talk about transferability. We've all had that experience, right? Success when they're with you on Monday. Then they come back on Thursday, perform that same Olympic lift. And you don't remind them of anything, and all of a sudden, all the wheels fall off, and they're back to, to, yeah. to stage one. Or the sport coach who has the quote unquote practice player, right? Who can do it always during the week, but can't seem to hack it on the weekend. And I'm like, bam, they had lost their luggage on their way from Phoenix to Indianapolis. They had lost some of their performance. 
it had seemingly dissolved. Guys who could get off the line with a flat back, a good first push, and a low leg drive were now falling out of their stance with their back rounded. Other guys who were able to drive down under their body, not reach and cast from a maximal velocity, were now reaching. All those bad habits that I thought had been vaccinated came right back to the fore. And so here's what I realized. The guys had improved because of the program. But if all we needed to maximize results was the what, was the physical program, the reps, the sets, the X's and O's, then why would you need coaches? We would just write a program, hand it to someone, and they, off they go. But no, we have an industry because we know that's not enough. To optimize those physical upgrades to the car, we need someone to optimize the driver, the mind, the person. And we call that technique, coordination, how they take that physical stuff and turn it into the movement stuff. And that's what had disappeared in my eyes. The what had worked, but how I had coached it did not stick. And it wasn't because they were suffering from a lack of information and cues. If anything, that had been the problem. There had been so much information delivered so often that there had been a dependency created. And that dependency required me to be present for them to optimize how they drove the vehicle. And so when I was removed, when I was out of the driver's seat, when driver school was over, they went back to their bad habits because the way I coached did not stick. And that stuck with me and ate me alive. Yeah. And the first thing I did, the first thing I did is recontextualize who I was as a coach. And I said, who am I? I am a teacher. Who are they? They are a student. What is my subject matter? Movement. What is my domain then? Motor learning. The science of teaching movement. And once I went one inch wide and 100 miles deep into that, I found the error of my ways. And what is it now? 11 years later, the language of coaching is born. Yeah. And what I really also love about this story is the extreme ownership, because you very well could have said, hey, these guys, what's wrong with these idiots? They didn't, they couldn't bring it all. Man, what were they drinking that night or they yeah. couldn't hack it? They couldn't hack the pressure, maybe mental. But you looked at yourself and said, what can I do better? Also, you could, you could have, quote unquote, blamed, uh, you know. Daryl and Mark and, and Luke, like, hey, why didn't you tell me got this any of this stuff? Why didn't you teach me, right? Which would have been ridiculous. But um, I love that you took extreme ownership and you said, this is on me. I need to get better. Yes. Yeah. You, you, well, you, you have to. I saw myself as a variable. And like that, a lot of coaches, I don't think, I think they know that like implicitly, but have they cognitively thought like, like you are literally a variable. Just like exercises, uh, specificity, progressive overload, right? Those are all variables. You, in the way you communicate and the way you get the words off out of the program and into the person, that is a variable at play here. How often have you invested in upgrading that variable, which, by the way, costs you no money at all? You don't need a bigger facility. You don't need more equipment to upgrade this variable. And so for me, that was what came flooding over my consciousness and has consumed me ever since. Wakes me up in the morning and keeps me up at night. Absolutely. And and, it, and so let's move on to the 3P performance model. Because obviously, when we look at these things, we have to understand where they're coming from. And the 3P performance model will really will tell us where it's coming from because it's either coachable or it's trainable. So talk to us about an overview of the three P performance model. Yeah. So just as a footnote to this, oftentimes we feel that what people in books or life don't talk about, they immediately disagree with. <laughs> and let me be very clear in writing a book about how to coach. It is in no way a statement on my belief around the importance of what we coach. Uh, ultimately, how you coach is subservient. It is anchored to what you coach. If you don't know what to coach, if you don't know what you are observing, if you don't know what error to correct, all that what stuff, 
then you have no business necessarily overly investing in the how. But ultimately, our degrees and our certifications flood us with the what of program design, of assessment, of specificity, progressive overload, periodization, sports science, technology, so on and so forth. It is that ability to communicate those pieces, which is the gap I believe needs filling. And so in the book, I start with the three Ps, which establish a theme, as you now know, Ant, throughout the book as a reference point, in that with chapter one, I have to lay the foundation and explicitly call out, you need to know what to coach <laughs> before you worry mm -hmm. about how to coach it. And that is ultimately the, the problem the three P model is trying to solve. And credit where credit is due, I, let's say, conceptualized the three P model when I was at, when I was at EXO. So very much so, it's, it's a huge part of the storyline for this. So the three Ps is very simple. On the bottom, it references the word position. In the middle, it references the word power. And in the top, it references the word pattern. And I kind of have that in a circular diagram because they're all interrelated. And in the middle, there is the performance. And so what does each word relate to practically? Well, position quite literally means, can they get in the positions that the movement requires? So can they achieve the required hip flexion? Can they achieve the required hip extension? Can they achieve the required internal external rotation? So on and so forth. And so in my mind, when I think of position, a simple way to look at it is, do they have adequate mobility and stability to perform the movement that you are coaching? Simply put. And within that, we call those trainable factors, or I analogize them to the vehicle, to the car. These are part of the physical assets the athlete has to move. The second then question is power. Do they have adequate strength and power, generally speaking, to perform the movement? So when you think of something like a 10-yard acceleration, a vertical jump, or a broad jump, all three of those movements are severely limited by your ability to express strength and power relative to body weight. So most certainly the movement that I'm observing is going to be impacted if you are overly weak relative to your body weight, and thus that could influence the movement pattern that I'm seeing. And so again, that is another quality that relates to what we're going to call the trainable side of the continuum and relate to the vehicle once again, so position and power. And then the final piece is the pattern. It's so how do they put all that together? How do they use that mobility, stability, strength, and power to create what we call technique or coordination or more generally movement? And that pattern is what I analogize to the driver. It's how they drive the vehicle and what I analogize to the features of movement that are coachable. And so if we have these three pieces and we then look at a program holistically, what do we need to do? Well, first and foremost, we need to have some level of an assessment to make sure that they have the underpinning physical qualities to perform the pattern, to perform the movement. And so something like a functional movement screen, a vertical and horizontal jump assessment, a strength and power assessment, and maybe even a medical assessment from a range of motion perspective, and any other number of variants that fall into those two categories of body positions and expression of power and strength. Once I have that information, that's basically like taking the car in for a checkup. And now we say, yeah, they have everything that we need to perform this movement. They have all the underpinning qualities. Fantastic. Now I take that person out on the field and I have them do their 10 meter sprint. And I video analyze that and I get a, a 10 meter time or a 10 yard time, excuse me, and spend a lot of time in Ireland if you haven't noticed. <laughs> <laughs> and so we now get that information. I say, okay, the movement I'm observing here is not optimal for them. They can make an improvement. Maybe it's more hip flexion to be able to create greater drive from an acceleration perspective. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. So if I can go back and say, yeah, they have the mobility, stability, strength, and power, that's not the issue. I now know that what I'm dealing with is a coachable problem. And that means I have verbal 
and nonverbal strategies at my disposal. I have my cues and the physical constraints or drills in my environment. And those are gonna be my two weapons of choice to craft and change this person's coordination. However, if the report comes back in, yeah, their relative strength is really poor, or they have a left hip mobility issue. As Stu McMillan says, you can't fix a mechanical problem with a technical cue. And so in those instances, you take that parallel approach that Gray Cook oftentimes talks about. I'm still on the field, giving them good cues, good constraints, coaching them up to get the car and the driver ready to go. But I know that car won't be optimized until we get that left brake fixed and that back shock upgraded. But here's the cool thing. I can now talk to my athlete and say, listen, this is gonna be a little bit of a slow burn until we get some of that hip mobility. This is gonna be a little bit of a slow burn until we upgrade some of that strength. And so by categorizing things as car problems, position and power, and driver problems, that's the pattern. I now know what's trainable and will take time, the slow burn, and what's coachable and subject to change right now with my cues and my constraints. And so simply for me, it was important to clarify that from the front end. And so that as you read the book, we're making the assumptions that you are dealing with a coachable problem and you specifically want to understand the verbal strategies you can use to change it. Some that dominates, I would say, the vast majority of airtime with a coach, which is them using words to influence movement. And so by putting that 3P model out there, we make it very clear on where language fits in to the overall holistic structure of upgrading movement. Absolutely. And, and I think, again, just the importance of understanding you can't just like you were talking about earlier you were just ai uh right you were just saying yeah. <laughs> things and you know maybe if things weren't working and you know, think those things needed to change because you didn't at the time even though you did you were looking at you know you were doing certainly were doing assessments but you were coaching the same way to the same to all the people but i love about yeah. kind of this idea about coaching as well that you know when it's coachable you really can't hurt someone from the coaching perspective. And uh, obviously there's going to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, the exception to this rule. But but for the most part, when you're throwing different external cues and analogies out there, sometimes it might not work with somebody because like you talk about later on in the book, we have to tap into the familiar. So somebody might not understand that analogy that you're talking about, especially for an older coach and you're referring to something of when you were a kid, but it's yeah. like that saying when you were a kid, you know, dumbbells and barbells can hurt my joints, but the language of coaching can't hurt me. Right. Sticks and stones. <laughs> um, but, so, you know, you're, you're always safe with the language of coaching here. Like you're always safe with a new analogy. Sometimes you're not safe with thinking, Oh, they, they, they probably just need strength. Cause when we're going in one direction, we see so many coaches that go that way. They just need to be stronger and then people can get hurt that way. So that's what I kind of love about this idea. Well, yeah, I mean, for, for me, it's, you know, the, the cue is the, the hammer and the chisel of the sculptor, you know? And when we, when we lift the heavy weights and when we run all the reps, right, that's me going to the quarry. And I'm down in the quarry and I'm, I'm getting my raw material. I'm getting my, my big chunks of marble and my big chunks of granite. And then I, I see the cues as the hammer and the chisel we use to craft those bulky abstract objects into something beautiful that we call movement. And so, yeah, uh, I, I, would, I would argue you can get hurt on both ends. Most certainly I've used cues. I think we all have that have backfired. Yeah. But like you said, you're, you're, the, the risk of getting hurt under an overly heavy barbell is probably far greater than telling one to explode off the line like a jet taking off. Exactly. So. <laughs> you can just try that. It should be fine. Um, yeah. Nick, I want you to, you mentioned it already a little bit. You met and talked about motor learning. and But I want to talk about, you had this difference between motor performance and motor learning. And you illustrated it really well with the coach teaching an O-lift and the trainer working on the client with knee pain during squats. And I yeah. think this was a really great example and it really sets us up for what is to come in the book. 
Yeah, so it, it goes back. It's the very basis of the first story that I shared uh, on this podcast. And that is, we've all had the experience of the person performing well when they're with us, but not performing as well when they're not with us, or at the very least, not being reminded by us. And so that suggests that just because you have taught <laughs> does not mean that they have learned, as John Wooden talks about it, as I referenced that quote in, in chapter one. So behind that quote is, you know, you have not taught uh, until they have learned, is this idea that there's this short-term thing that happens when you are coaching someone and interacting with them that we call a change in performance. So I give a cue to an Olympic lift is, is the story in the book. And a coach gives a cue and the person improves. And then that coach goes and works with another athlete or it comes back in a few days time and they're doing the Olympic lift again. And they look across the room and they're scratching their head. And this guy is right back to his old lifting ways. And then he goes over and he reminds him of the cue and he gives him the cue a few times. And all of a sudden the movement is back. And it's just this vicious cycle of one step forward, one step back, one step forward, one step back. It's the, it's the practice player that doesn't seem to be able to compete on the weekends at the same level. And what's the biggest difference in the scenarios? Well, in a scenario where they're successful, the coach is present. And the scenario where they're not, right, the athlete isn't successful. And so what's the difference there? And so we call this short-term change, which oftentimes is accompanied by the coach, a shift in performance. And this long-term change, whereby they're able to keep that performance gain, whether or not the coach is around. And we call that learning. Because learning, by definition, needs to be owned by the athlete. If your athlete requires your presence and your reminders, they have not learned. And by John Wooden's litmus test, you have not taught. And so that example of the Olympic lifting coach is contrasted with a personal trainer who is dealing with someone who's overly valgus when they're squatting, has achy knees, and just wants to improve their general performance to play with their kids. And so is giving all these internal cues, keep your knees straight, don't let your knees cave in, knees, 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 and there's no change at all. And as the story goes, they get a perform better mini band, <laughs> chuck it around the knees <laughs> and say, I want you to keep tension in the mini band. And what's cool is even once they take the mini band off, they simply can say squat as if you have tension in the mini band. And so from that day forth, the person is able to perform the squatting movement, whether or not there is a reminder. And so the difference between the two stories is something about the interaction between the personal trainer and the client and something about the interaction between the strength coach and the athlete. It's something in those interactions that was different in that in the Olympic lifting example, there was change in performance, but no change in learning. But in the personal trainer example, there was change in performance and learning. And that client could come back and continue to perform that movement over and over again. And I know we're going to get into this. Ultimately, if you're just focusing on performance, if you're just focusing on the acute change when you are there, if you are fulfilling, and I don't mean this to offend anyone, your own ego by being needed, by needing to be heard all the time, then ultimately you're propping up their performance. But the question you have to ask yourself, when they leave that gym, when they go home and they play with their kids that evening, are they moving as well as they did when they were with you? And if the answer is no, the answer is no, I think you have to ask yourself some hard questions. Because for me, what I'm pursuing is yes. If I do my job correctly, I get better performance now, but I do it in a way that allows for better learning later, learning that they own, because that's what they come to us for. Absolutely. And I think it's in this section, I was once the definitions for acquisition phase and retention phase came up, I was like, oh no, more periodization stuff. But it's actually within the within that training session uh within that yeah. even, that exercise uh can you talk to us just give us an overview really quick of acquisition phase and retention phase and the, and the importance of 
Anthony, the silent set. <laughs> yes, yes, the silent set. And so acquisition is simple. It's when you're it's when you're coaching. It's when you're trying to make a change. It's when you're trying to make an influence. So if you're throwing out new drills, if you're throwing out new cues, you can consider yourself in an acquisition phase. And that's a, a formal term we use in motor learning. So in the book, I try to give you the, the real words. So if you want to go learn more, you can look them up. Uh, the retention then is, okay, we think we've done some teaching here and we think some learning has happened, but we're not sure yet. So we want to assess if learning has taken place. And especially since many people on this call are working in strength conditioning and personal training, your litmus test might not be competition directly. It might be within the physical training environment itself. And so the retention test is they come back in. The only way you can check for learning or to see if the improvements have been retained, i.e. retention, is if you remove yourself from the role of coach, nudger, reminder. And so let's give a practical example. They come in on a Monday and you've done some Olympic lifting with them. You've had a couple light bulb moments. Okay, you've come up with some cues that seem to really stick, resonate, and they manifest an improved movement. Happy days, high fives all around. Now let's say your next session with that person is on Thursday or even the following Monday, you're repeating that workout again. If you feel you've laid the groundwork for learning and now you want to assess if that groundwork has resulted in a structural, tangible change, meaning they own the change, meaning you can, by definition, say that they've learned, then you need to entertain what I call the silent set. And the silent set is exactly what it sounds like. Okay, Ant, we're going to go back through that Olympic lift that we did last week, okay? Hit your warm-up sets, and then we've got three working sets. I'm just going to observe... I might jump in a little bit later on. Let's see how you go. So I give you a little bit of that clarification. So especially, Ant, for you, if a lot of your clients are used to you talking a lot, you can't just zip it. They're like, what's wrong with this guy? So I'm going to let them know from very early on, okay, I'm going to now shut up. It's your time to own it, okay? I want to see how you do on these first three sets. And so if I'm silent and they're owning that silence, they're owning that space with their own thoughts, their own ideas, their own focus. Now I get an authentic idea of what they have actually retained and learned. And so the silent set is this fluid concept of when you shut up, they can start to step in and own the moment. And it's only when they own the moment can we assess our learning. And I like to call those silent sets. Awesome. Nick, can you just elaborate a little bit on this in terms of, so if I, I just say, right up say guys i'm not going to say anything to you guys right now not even in a warm up set just let them go and let them do a few sets what if they are doing something you're feeling like oh man they're really they're going to get hurt doing this obviously we want to yeah. step in right yeah, of course of course this is a fluid idea yeah this is okay. a fluid idea but all, all people need to know is silent sets it, like in you're reading the book you can tell the audience right now i don't give you some predetermined equation yeah. on how to do this you know it's not like hey 33% of the time no what we need to understand is anytime you stop giving feedback, cues, reminders, or prompts, and they own the moment, it is their voice in the headspace, not yours. Then you get a clear understanding of how their focus and movement marry up. And if that focus plus movement equals improved movement, we can say, okay, they've learned. They've owned it. It's been downloaded onto the hard drive. And so if you're doing five working sets of your hang clean, for example, you might open up with the first one or two sets where you say nothing and you're just say, okay, is that improved hip extension? Is that drop under the bar, that snap during the catch? Did those improvements we saw a week ago, have they been retained? And if after that first set, you're like, man, the person has lost the plot, you might get right back in, okay, you're back in the quarry. You're back working with your cues and your constraints and that's fine. You go at it again. But even in there, you might go silent set, coach them up for the next one, two silent sets, and then finish up with a bit of coaching on the last one. All I'm trying to convey with the idea of the silent set is it is the most practical, practical, simple way to insert micro retention tests, micro check for learning, check for understanding throughout your coaching paradigm. 
no matter how you're coaching. And ultimately, it's in those silent sets, Ant, that we turn off our mouth and turn on our eyes and our ears. And it's in those silent sets that we get to see the echo of our impact. No other set is echoing our impact until we see them own it themselves. And I just want to perpetuate that as a concept, as an idea, as a micro strategy you can use often, as often as you feel you need, when you feel you want to get a pulse check on, is this working? Are they owning the change? Absolutely. Good stuff. Uh, I think it segues nice into this idea in terms of more coaching uh, before we get to internal, external cues, analogies, et cetera. But this idea about the challenge point hypothesis or really the Goldilocks principle about that just right principle. Can you uh, give us an overview of that idea? Yeah. So, you know, the, the Goldilocks principle is not too cold, not too hot, just right. And kind of the scientific terminology that uh, Dr. Guadagnoli, that's a, that's a mouthful from UNLV, or at least he was at UNLV, is called the challenge point hypothesis. And it's exactly what you would think. If it's too easy, you are not being challenged. And thus, you do not feel fulfillment when you have success. You lose motivation. And inevitably, if you lose motivation, you lose attention. If it's too difficult, you don't have success often enough. It starts to erode self-efficacy, self-belief. You lose motivation. You lose the attention to continue to pursue it. If you get it in the middle, it's hard enough where you're not successful all the time. Thus, there's a little bit of that dopamine reward when you do have success. Because if you fail all the time, it erodes motivation. If you're successful all the time, it erodes motivation because you become disinterested. So it's that middle ground that we're trying to find. And ultimately, when I talk about the challenge point hypothesis in the book, it, it underpins this idea that in addition to our cues driving attention, and our cues influencing the motivation behind that attention, equally the environment is as powerful as a catalyst for driving and crafting attention and motivation. And thus, to optimize the impact of your language, you want to make sure you're coaching someone at a level of a progression, at a level of difficulty that is appropriate. Not too cold, not too hot, just right. And so to be honest with you, Ant, I feel that as a concept, as a principle, is fairly embedded in many of the other ideas across periodization and program design. It's just looking at it through the lens and importance of how it influences language and coaching. Yeah, and I think anybody can, there's other, obviously, just in, in learning in general, yet yeah, people have to understand that. I know learning, trying to learn guitar, especially right now during the, uh, <laughs> during the quarantine, just trying to take a, like a little time every night. And, and one of the things, like when you learn scales, I, I got this one program that's really good because they, they give you four exercises that increase the level of difficulty. And then they give you, uh, some backing tracks that basically start off slow beats per minute, and then increase it a little bit. And then you go to a fast speed. So it, a lot of times, too many times, they give us these crazy exercises and then have us, okay, here's the speed you want to do it at once. If you just keep practicing, you'll do it. And then I lose interest and then I'm gone. So it, by, yeah, by, well, but by sure. working through that uh, from an easier perspective, but still makes it sound good. I feel like I'm making some progress. I feel like, cool, I can keep going because I'm moving forward. I want, I want the good stuff. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. So. Well, and again, to tie it back to the language piece, if the dang thing I'm doing is so difficult that by itself, it is so challenging to me. And let's say I'm teaching someone to do a, a single leg squat for the first time when they have been, might've been better off doing a, a lunge. So a split stand with, with a bit more stability, that single leg squat might be so challenging for me to even comprehend a cue that could feasibly improve it. I don't even have that attentional bandwidth because my physical inability is causing me to have to then deploy so much attention to this novel thing that I'm doing or this difficult task that I'm performing. So getting that difficulty level just right also allows enough attentional real estate to be available so we can give them that mental spotlight to focus on the right thing to increase the odds of a successful outcome. Excellent. Do you, 
So segueing this into attention, you what you call the currency of learning, and, and you even go as far as to say, if we don't get this right, the attention piece, nothing else in the book will be of use. So talk to us about <laughs> yeah. capturing, capturing, keeping, and directing their attention. Yeah, so the story that I've been using just to illustrate this point, and I don't know if I've ever said this one to you, Ant, but... You know, I'll be at a conference. Let's say there's a couple hundred people in the crowd. I'll ask the question, okay, how many of you have been on 100 plus flights? Quite a few hands go up. Yeah, how many of you have been on 500 plus flights? A lot of hands go down. And how many of you have maybe been on, on 1,000 flights? And there's always just a few hands left. And I'll ask the uh, unsuspecting individual to stand up. All of a sudden, their heart rate rises. They think they're at you know, some kind of a, 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 a magic type show. They say, <laughs> okay, awesome. You've been on a thousand plus flights. That's a lot of repetitions of flying. There's one thing that I know happens on every single one of those. And I know, in fact, they're putting more pressure on getting it right as the years have gone on. And that is the safety briefing. So, Ant, <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Ant, can you please recite the safety briefing for everybody in the crowd? And inevitably, the whole room rumbles with a laugh. The person starts to ah, speak. And I say, give them a round of applause and have them sit down. And it illustrates a simple point that. Just because you are around something all the time or have a high level or a high number of repetitions or exposures to something does not mean you've learned from it. And go no farther than to have kids and as a parent have to repeat yourself over and over again, you know most certainly that repetition doesn't always mean learning. And so when we look at these multiple examples that you can pull from life, once you start to think of it through this lens, you realize that proximity, just because you're next to something or around something all the time, does not mean learning. You only learn from the things you pay attention to. And arguably, as I talk about relating this to deep practice, right, or deep work, as I like to say on the business side, we've talked about Cal Newport in the past, that I have to deeply invest my attention in something to extract, to gain from it. Attention is the USB cord. It is what transfers information from the world onto your internal hard drive. You know, our world is what we attend to, full stop. And so I press that point and I articulate that, I think in a number of ways in chapter two, which you're referring to. And so as a coach, I talk about ways in the book that we can capture attention. And ultimately, and I'm doing little Q-tips on Instagram about this, and I just did one the other day, but to capture attention, two major things capture attention. One, things that are absolutely important to us as an individual. And what is more important than your life? So oftentimes, things that relate to your personal survival will capture your attention. That's why you can be on autopilot driving home from work but if you're not used to driving in New York City, instantly the radio goes down, the sandwich you're normally nibbling is now back in the brown bag, both hands are on the wheel, 10 and two, and you're focusing completely because survival is on play right now and I need to make sure my attention is on point. So the reality is you're not bringing venomous snakes and cheetahs into practice every day. So it's hard to make the play on the life-threatening aspects that pull attention into the world. But there's something else that pulls attention into the world. And this, my friends, everyone can use and can use to great effect once they recognize the secret. And that is attention is also attracted by unfamiliar and unexpected things because unfamiliar and unexpected things could lead, right, to a possible danger. And so even though we know that danger is not present, the brain is still calibrated to unexpected, unfamiliar which we can collectively call novelty, okay? And this doesn't mean you have to rock up in a clown suit before your training sessions, but even simple things. If your warm-up is normally in a straight line and you shift it to a circle, that is going to be unexpected, possibly unfamiliar. And if you're someone that talks all the time or talks really fast, but then all of a sudden you slow down, you pause, and you start speaking like President Obama, that is gonna pull in your clients <laughs> because that is unexpected from Anthony Renner. 
And so we could go on for days, and I give many examples in the book, as you can cite, but it's that unfamiliar, unexpected, that novelty, change it up is what I like to refer to it as, that's going to help capture attention. The other little one that we, we, we all know, but rarely do we use as well as we can, and you and I have already been doing this, Ant. I just did it there. That's the name game. Yeah. The second I drop your name out into the ether, it does not matter. I've got you at least for a moment. And I talk about it in terms of this idea of the cocktail party effect. And so using the name game and using novelty, names and novelty, novelty is unfamiliar, unexpected. And ever so often, if you can get the venomous snake or the cheetah in, you might get some better results as well. But that's how you capture it. And I'm, I'm not going to go as, as long-winded here on the keep. But if you want to keep attention, it's simple. If attention is the currency of learning, Rena, then motivation is the currency of attention. And ultimately, you only pay attention to things long-term that you are motivated by, that you are deeply fulfilled by. And so in the book, when I get into memory, I start unlocking this idea from capture, how do we keep attention? And that's ideas like the why and the what, the value proposition. Why are you doing this? How is this going to connect back to your ultimate goal? Using language that they are familiar with that taps into that end goal. So if I want to be an NFL all-star and I'm using languages about NFL American football movements, as I'm teaching you this mundane sprint or squat, I've now taken your why and I've injected it into my cue to help you learn the what that ultimately should improve that end outcome that you want, which is being a better football player that wins trophies. Capture and keep. And then obviously we can get into direct. And that's what the latter half of the book is about. Yeah, and I love this story, and this is why it's really important to pay attention to your clients, to have a conversation with them, Bingo. not only because when you were talking about the Superman example oh. in the book was yeah. great. Can you go over that really quick? So, Because I, I really think that's important for people to... Um, I always loved, there's a restaurateur in New York City. He owns the Shake Shack. It's called, his name is Danny Meyer. A lot of people know him now because of uh, they got some uh, the uh, the uh, payroll protection money and everybody had a heart attack. But Danny Meyer um, always um, had a great um, way to make sure that people, his staff gave extra attention to their clients. And this was through some customer retention management software. So the waiters would make sure that they found stuff out about that table and they would put it into the software. And so sometimes the hostess would know when the person came in, oh, the Winkelmans are here. How are the English Bulldogs doing? Right. Yeah. So you now you were yeah. like, oh, my God, they how do they how does the hostess know about my English Bulldogs? Um, and then the manager might yeah, yeah. come over later. And so they started to create these things. And a lot of software now, like MindBody, has these things that it doesn't have to be with just one trainer. But to start to find out what the kids names the dogs names what people love what people like like do in their in their spare time can you just go over that that superman story i love it y yeah yeah and so i i couldn't remember if i put that in the book to be honest with you and so it's it's a great story and it's one that i didn't fully appreciate until many years had gone by and so the way the story goes is i'm, I'm working with a client as a personal trainer i was maybe 6 months into the gig and so we're sitting down and we're doing the initial client interview, looking at their program goals, their likes, their dislikes, so on and so forth. And so when I asked this gentleman what his goal was, he gave me a very unexpected answer. And that is, he said, listen, I'm separated from my wife and we have a five-year-old son. He lives with his mom and my son is everything to me. And, and I could tell that there must've been some, obviously a separation is always painful, but there, feel, there felt like there was something more here. But as, as a youngster, you know, not married, I, I probably couldn't fully appreciate it at the time. <laughs> and he says to me, and what you got to understand is my son's got a poster Superman on the wall. And he absolutely looks up to him. He wants to be him. And I want to be that for, for my son. And so I'm trying to do everything I can to get, get my body right, my life right, to be my son Superman. And I remember at the moment thinking, man, that is some heavy that's some heavy stuff for the rec center gym session that we're about to go through. <laughs> but like, you don't forget that. I'm, I'm sorry. You just don't forget that. And we're, we're two or three sessions in 
and he's performing a single leg RDL. And he's like most people, he's struggling to balance. He most certainly is struggling to keep that flat position from head to heel. And he gets to a couple sets of me coaching unsuccessfully. <laughs> and I remember that story. And I knew it was sensitive, but I also knew that I wasn't going to throw this cue out many times. And even in, in my immature mind, I knew that. And so I said, listen, on your next rep, I want you to be like Superman, the Superman on your son's wall. I want you to be like Superman going off the building, catching Loa's lane. I want you as long as you can from head to heel. Get off that building. And so you can kind of see his, almost, his, his grip increase around the dumbbells. And he gets down, bam, 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 like long body position, nails it. And he, and he gets up, and we don't really exchange words, but he has tears in his eyes. And he just says, thank you. And shit, man, I, I've, never, I've never forgotten that moment. And it wasn't until I got done probably three quarters of the way writing the book. I was like, this isn't a book about cueing. This is a book about connecting. By getting my cues right, it requires two things to happen. My language has to connect to them, and it has to connect them to their movement. Like, what is more powerful than that, that we build this bridge between us, but then I help you create a deeper bridge within your own body, within your mind and body? And I don't know how far you're into the book yet, Amp, but in chapters six and, and seven, I start to really reveal that as an idea, and it's one I'd like to grow over time. Because ultimately, for language to stick, it needs to tell stories that relate to me. And I believe the best cues check both of those boxes. Yeah. And so that's why that story is so powerful, is you can have an opportunity to inject, literally, your client's lived experience into the cues you're going to use to make their lived experience better. I mean, that just... If that's not powerful, I don't know what is. Yeah, absolutely. And I do apologize. It wasn't in the book. It's in the Language of Coaching webinar that if you go ah, to Nick's yes. website, <laughs> you can sign up. I watched that this week. Um, and um, so, yeah, that was in the webinar. But guys, if you go to Nick's website and sign up for his mailing list, you'll get a link to that webinar. This webinar is really good. It's um, about two hours, actually, and uh, but yeah. it's, it's worth it. It's uh, And it'll give you a really good overview while you're waiting for the book, which is sold out, to come in the mail. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> Nick, let's go on to um, – I, I, I wasn't going to do this, but I, we're, we're, we got a lot of – I've already spent a lot of time, but I have to go into this idea about focus. And you, you told a story about – showing your athletes how important because it's so hard to get them to focus especially if you're training young athletes to yeah. show them how important focus affects strength can you go over that for uh for yeah. the listeners yeah you know funny alan cosgrove was was jumping on we had a little bit of what we called a coaching conversation of the day and he still says to this day this strategy is one that he uses with everybody uh just again to start to get buy-in and belief in, in what this stuff is all about. And so I, I remembered, this was a couple of years back, I was working with athletes. I'm like, man, remember those old school, you know, magnetic bracelets that everyone used to wear? Yeah. And you'd go to the shopping mall and what they would do is they'd have you put the bracelet on and they'd have you put an arm out and show you how strong you are. And then they would have you do it again without the bracelet to show you how weak you are. But it was a little sleight of hand because they used a strategy to distract you. And by distracting you, you couldn't focus on being strong in the arm, and all of a sudden your arm would go down. But people wouldn't realize this, just like you don't know when you're dealing with a skilled magician that they just picked your pocket. <laughs> and so it's a sleight, of, a sleight of hand is really a sleight of attention. And so I illustrate this to my athletes, and at the time, many of them had had, <laughs> or still had, those, those metallic bracelets or necklaces or foot insoles, whatever. And it, it goes something like this. You find the biggest guy, you know, or strongest person in the group, and you have him get in front and say, okay, get in a good stable stance, put your right arm out. Okay, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna press on your wrist as hard as I can, and I want you to make your arm immovable, make it steel. And I say nothing. So I get this size, are you ready? Yeah, strong, yeah, okay. Start to press, ah, 
about five seconds, right? They're strong. They're holding it up. They say, okay, I'm going to have you do the same thing again. Now what I do is I switch my position. I'm standing in front of them. My hand's still on the wrist. Like, I'm still going to push down. And your arm still needs to be strong as anything. But I put a finger in front of them like you're doing a, you know, a, a breathalyzer test. I want your eyes to follow my finger. Yeah, okay, now I want you to count backwards from 100, okay, by twos. And so a little bit of a chuckle from the group. And so I'm like, are you ready? Like, yeah, okay. So start to watch my fingers and start to count now. And so now they're, their eyes are moving, they're counting out loud, some struggling to do so, I should add. I'm like, okay, here we go. And I start to push on their arm. And it's kind of like they stop talking every time they try to bring their arm. Like, no, keep talking, keep talking. I start moving my hand bigger. And all of a sudden with one hand, I can take the strongest person in the group and I can bring their arm right to their side. And I've done this at the Perform Better stage as well with an unsuspecting person. And in doing so, what it illustrates is if you don't get your focus on the one big thing, if you don't get your focus on the most important thing, literally your focus can be the downfall of your speed, your technique, your strength and power. So to think that your mind does not matter is a fool's agenda. We have got to be as disciplined in the mind around how we focus as what we focus on. And once I started doing that fairly early in the training process as an illustrative exercise on the power of focus, the reality is people focused a lot better and they listened with an idea of comprehending and applying, not just appeasing me as the coach. Love it. I just cannot wait to get my kids to try this on. Uh, <laughs> can't wait. Uh, Nick, let's finish up here with the conversation that we have to have. It, I almost want to say it. It really, this to me on the podcast years ago, when you were doing the art of coaching, it's when people really started to, the conversation really started to change. And that's about internal and external cues. And you're really the the person who started to identify and separate and really talk how, how important about how important external cueing and analogies were. Um, so I want you to go over uh, the internal and external cues and, and why it's so important that we really understand uh, that external cues and analogies are really the direction that we need to focus on. Yeah. So the, the first thing is just defining what a cue is. So in the book, I talk about this idea of a coaching communication loop, which outlines, let's say, the key points in time around teaching a movement where we use communication. And the cue, by definition, is always the last thing that we say before the athlete moves. And it doesn't matter if we say it or the athlete says it, but it's the last idea that goes in their head before they move. And it's meant to be the passenger in their mind, the spotlight in their mind, guiding their focus uh, or their intention, how, whatever word you'd prefer to use, while they move. And so let's be very clear, that's what we mean when we say the word cue. And so when it comes to these ideas that can enter the mind uh, before someone moves, they live on this continuum of internal to external. And in the book, I broaden it and beyond just internal and external, and I kind of talk about it in terms of a zoom lens on a camera. So let's all imagine Usain Bolt coming off the start line uh, as if we've taken a picture right as his back foot is about to come off the line. So we'll go ahead and freeze it right there. And so if we think of our cueing from a coaching perspective as a zoom lens, the internal cues are any cues that we use that relate to body motion directly. So this is motion of a joint, motion of a muscle, where external cues are the outcomes or the goals the body is trying to achieve. So it references the ground, push the ground away, or the outcome I'm trying to achieve, you know, explode to the finish as fast as you can, and everything in between. And so if we use the example of Usain Bolt sprinting off the line, if we zoom all the way in, we have what's called a narrow internal cue. And that's where I might say something like knee extension, or hip extension, or ankle dorsiflexion. So it relates to one muscle or one joint. I can then zoom out. Instead of talking about the joint, I can talk about the limb. And I can say, drive your leg back or drive your leg back into the ground. I call those broad internal cues. Then we can get into what we call a hybrid. Okay, drive your leg into the ground. So part one is leg, part two is ground. Ground is external. And so we call those hybrid. Then we can say, squash the reference to leg, explode off the ground, 
or push the ground back. And that's what we call a close external cue because the ground is close to me. And then finally, explode towards the finish. Let's say the finish is 10 yards in front of me or 10 meters in front of me. And that's what we're gonna call a far external cue. And just to put a footnote on close and far, if I was playing tennis, close is the racket and the contact with the ball. Far is trajectory and endpoint of where I want the ball to land. You could think of something similar in baseball and golf, for example. And so we have this full zoom lens from narrow internal to far external. And then we have analogies. And just for the, for the sake of brevity, analogies operate similar to external cues. And that's all we need to, to reference right now. And the research really kicked into gear in 98. And now fast forward to 2020. And we have north of 170 papers that have analyzed internal versus external cues. Last idea, it goes into the head before they move and thus guides focus and intention. And we know without question that well over 96% of those studies show that an external focus not only is going to increase performance, right? We talked about that earlier now, but by the nature of external cues and analogies allows the person to retain that improvement and thus express it later in what we have called learning. And that's learning that does not require the reminder. And so external cues seem to be speaking, if you would, the language of the motor system. And as I get into in the book, what I'd like to think of as clear and relatable detail is that within external cues, once you understand a little bit about motor control, it becomes self-evident why they work so well. When we put a goal in the mind, push this away, go here, go there, achieve this jump with X effort, explode, push, drive, snap, punch. When we put this outcome-oriented language into the mind, it is like putting an address into the GPS. It gives it an outcome to achieve, and the GPS, like the body, takes care of everything else. If we think that the human mind can reduce the body to step-by-step -step control of head, shoulders, knees, and toes, we are absolutely fooling ourselves. And so as I talk about at length in the book, it is not that we need to abandon internal language or internal cues. Rather, we need to use that when we are describing a movement when we are explaining a movement. But ultimately, and after I explain, after I explain to you that I need you to be long and keep your shoulder, knees, and toes connected, to do that now, I want you to think about pushing off the ground and getting tall in the air. And so they're companions, they're neighbors. But I go to great lengths to get you to understand, use internal language to describe a movement, use external cues and analogies to coach it. And so ultimately, nothing in the book will eradicate certain language choices. Rather, it's going to help you organize them into what I call your language locker. And I, I love the study about injuries, too, because, right, the, uh, I'm not sure if Gabby Wolf did that one, but it was about uh, injuries on performance. And I think, we, you know, so many of us have people that are so focused on, well, my knee hurts during this, my elbow hurts during that. If we keep talking about it, it's what they think about. So even if we don't feel like we've we've had internal cues, just talking about it sometimes can probably affect that movement. Well, well, that's it. And if you were to come watch me, coach, I, I still reduce the amount of internal language. And the, the reason is you're exactly right. We know following, it, following an injury, people are much more likely to be internally focused and go no farther than to watch someone who's blown out their ACL or their hamstring come back into training and they all have their little fidgets that they do where they do the one, two, three and they squat down and put their hand on their hamstring or they shake out their leg after every rep. The reality is there are many things that happen naturalistically that cause people to go inward. Similarly, they've shown that pressure especially in really important moments, increase the odds of people going inward. So if people are more likely to go inward, and it's a natural attempt at self-control, it's a natural attempt at controlling complexity and controlling the outcome. But ultimately, the more we go inward, the more we go micro, the harder it is to achieve the macro. 
And these internal cues, well, by deploying them, we become the architect of our own demise. We start to create the outcome that we are hoping to protect against. And so as coaches, I believe with this book, we now cannot deny the fact that we know this. And we need to treat the mind with as much care as we do the body because they are interlinked. And the language of the motor system is the language of goals and outcomes. And so if I coach you over time as a strength coach or a sport coach, or I rehabilitate you over time as a physical therapist, and I'm using external language whenever possible and wherever possible to guide the way you organize your movement in terms of the environment, I believe, and I think there's evidence to suggest this, we decrease the odds of you choking in competition. We increase the odds of you performing arguably in more of a flow state when things really matter. And over time, I do believe they will be able to connect the way we coach to risk of injury, especially when it comes to return to performance on someone with a prior injury. That's how important this is because we cannot separate mind from body and cues are the number one tool we use to guide the mind in training and rehabilitation. So interesting. And I do want to just make sure everybody goes to Nick's site and <laughs> signs up and he's, he's doing some offering some great stuff on YouTube, on his Instagram, Nick, it's Nick Wink, just Nick Winkleman, right? At, at Nick yep, Winkleman. You got it. Okay. Yep. And uh, it's the language of coaching for the website, Nick, or. Yeah. The language of coaching.com. And, and I'm going to, you know, and you've given me a lot of advice, but we're slowly but surely growing it. I'm going to do a global book club. I'll announce that this week. I've got Martin Rooney next up on the coaching conversation. All these are going up on, on YouTube and Instagram and Twitter are flying with micro tips from the book and, and beyond. Yep. Absolutely. So Nick, once again, congratulations on what is really not to overstate it is a game changer in this industry. And it's, this is just the start of it, everybody. It's a, you're really going to be seeing b between uh, the social media channels and what Nick's doing and his, this book, the next book and whatever online courses he's having and lectures. Uh, you got to be part of this. It's going to change the way you coach. So Nick, congratulations. And thank you so much for giving me so much time. This is the longest hit the gym with the train coach interview we've ever had. So I appreciate you coming. Well, <laughs> and, and I, and I say this with all sincerity, you have fundamentally changed my life and the life of so many coaches. You gave me the very first platform to give this information a voice. And for that, I will be forever grateful. All right. And I'll remind everybody, we are going to do what we we're going old school. We're going to do a uh, four to six segments from Nick coming up <laughs> on some episodes, the short segments, and then we're going to do a special episode. I'm going to put them all together. So stay tuned for that. So Nick, thanks again, bud. Thanks, brother. All right, that's going to do for episode 281 of the Strength Coach Podcast. Remember, you can try strengthcoach.com out for 30 days. We extended the trial. Just a buck, you'll have access to all the articles, videos, and programs, as well as the best forum on the net. It's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every day. To access that offer, go to strengthcoach.com. Click the Join Now button to get started on your 30-day trial. Special thanks to Chris Parr and the folks over at Perform Better. Remember, free shipping on orders over $49. Restrictions do apply. And check out their resource, the video series on protecting and saving your fitness business. Go to performbetter.com for all their products and info on their educational offerings. Thanks to Coach Boyle and Nick Winkleman for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength and conditioning, performance enhancement, and the language of coaching. Thanks to Adam Doughty, Tim Robinson, and Train Heroic. Remember, Coach Boyle and I use Train Heroic to deliver all of our online training. So go there, trainheroic.com. Start your free 14-day trial. Thanks to Alan Cosgrove for the Results Fitness University business of fitness segment check them out at resultsfitnessuniversity.com it's where you can sign up for their free webinar leading your fitness business through the year and now thanks to great cook and functional movement systems check them out at functionalmovement.com my name is anthony rana remember check my book out be like the best 50 interviews top fitness professionals after each interview is a be like an action step or a challenge that will help you be like the best. 
go to BeLikeTheBest.com or on Amazon or on Target Publications or my site, ContinueFit.com. That's going to do it. Thanks for listening, and I'll speak to you next time.